My name is Mikael Witteblad, and I am the head of the research program here at SNS. Today's seminar will focus on refugees, immigrants, and labor market integration within the Nordic countries. We have invited researchers from Sweden, Denmark, and Norway to discuss this important issue. What are the experience on labor market integration? What can Sweden learn from Denmark and Norway? What are the similarities and differences between the Nordic countries? The seminar is the first activity uh, within the new project at SNS called Learnings from Integration. The aim of the project is to explore how uh, the integration works and how it can be improved. The seminar is also part of the seminar series Forum uh, for Integration Policy. We are very happy to have uh, to welcome Bernt Bratsberg to Stockholm and SNS. Bernt is a professor of economics at the University of Oslo and a senior fellow at Frisch Centret. Bernt, you would tell us more uh, about the labor market integration of immigrants uh, in Norway. We are also pleased to have uh, Marie-Louise Schultz-Nielsen with us today. Uh, Marie-Louise is a senior researcher in economics at the Rockwool Foundation Research Unit in Copenhagen. Marie-Louise, uh, you will give a Danish perspective. Uh, also, a warm welcome to Olaf Åslund, professor of economics at Uppsala University. Uh, Olaf is also the director general at the Institute for for Evaluation of Labor Market and Education Policy, EFAU. Olof, you will present a new research from Sweden. So welcome to all of you. Today's moderator is uh, Helena Stolnert. Helena is a, co a communication advisor with experience as a director of communication for SSAB and Saab, amongst other things. So welcome, Helena. The stage is yours. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you so much, Michael. Uh, <clears throat> in addition to the introduction uh, from Michael, uh, I just want to add that this subject is, of course, of, course of great interest for all of us in Sweden and in other European countries as well, as uh, integration is foreseen to be maybe the most important subject for the coming election next, years, next year. And uh, yeah, it's wise to learn more about this, of course, especially as this is an area heavily affected by fake news. Uh, as you heard, we have three speakers today. Each of them will speak for 15 minutes and followed by maybe one or two follow-up questions. And after that, we will gather them all on the scene here and we will have a discussion in which I hope you all will participate. As uh, we will start now with, with Olof Oslund, who is the uh, Director General, as you heard, of, of the Institute of Evaluation of Labor Market and Education Policy. Most welcome, Olof. So, no, perhaps. Uh, okay, thank you very much for inviting me to this interesting seminar. Um, the paper or the results I will be presenting come from a uh, paper included in an article included in uh, the two 2017 issue of uh, Nordic Economic Policy Review, and so are the contributions of Bernd and Marie-Louise as well. Um, so let me just first start with, with a very brief Nordic perspective. Um, here, this is uh, employment rates by country, origin, and gender in 2016, uh, and I have ranked uh, based on the employment rate among the foreign-born. Uh, so we start with the shining example of Iceland at the top, and then, then we, we fall down. And we also have the OECD and the EU28 as comparisons there. So I, I would argue that 
there is a case for studying the Nordic countries in, in, a, in a unified context. Uh, you could argue that we are more similar, but also a bit different. Uh, these, are for all, these figures are for all foreign-born. So it's not only refugees and, and tide movers, it's, it's also labor migrants. And what we see there is, well, the, the Nordic countries, we don't, if you look at Mays, for example, we don't rank particularly poorly compared to other countries, or compared to the OECD or EU28. Uh, but what we see if we look at the females, for example, is that there are huge gaps. So the distance between the employment rate among the native-born, given by the circles, and the foreign-born among the dots, is not so much driven by a low absolute level among the foreign-born, but by a high uh, level among the native-born. And this is, of course, a particular peculiarity or particularity of the, of the Nordic context that we have high employment rates, high labor force, force participation, both among men, men and women. And this is, of course, some, somewhat a uh, topic for political debate. But I think that there is a case for studying the Nordic countries together and thinking about similarities and differences there. The Swedish study that I will be presenting now is, we have looked at first-time foreign-born immigrants coming to Sweden or getting the residence permits in the period 1990 to 2014. So we take a long view back. And we identify, or we, use, we study countries of origin that could be classified crudely as non-Western. And this immigration is mainly related to humanitarian migration, either that they are refugees or asylum seekers, or that they at some time have come as relatives to these groups. There are also labor migrants, so there are all stu students in this data that we have. So it's not refugees and, and asylum seekers only. We look at those who are in working age when they come, and we follow them until they are age 20, 65. And we require that they remain in Sweden until the time of observation. So these are not people coming in and going out. Uh, so we have about half a million of individuals in our data. The paper also includes a discussion of poli policy options and experiences. I will, uh, by and large, leave this for the panel debate here. So in this paper, we study something we call the first contact with the labor market. And one way of thinking about the first contact is to say, when did this individual have his or her first positive earnings? How long after he or she entered Sweden did that happen? Uh, and this is, on this axis, we have the cohorts coming in different years, and the different lines then give the fraction that at some point in time have had some positive earnings, one, three, five, 10, and 15 years after immigration. Uh, and I think that this way of measuring um, labor market entry was first done in a SNS report from 2006. And it's a really brilliant idea, so we used it uh, again. Um, and what we see here in the first left panel of this, this graph is a well-known fact that the demand situation in the labor market is really crucial for the opportunities for marginal groups. Those who arrived in the 1990s, when the labor market was in a really bad state, had a very hard time getting in touch with the labor market, or getting in touch with employers. After leaving the crisis of the 1990s, we see that the patterns are rather stable. In the right panel, we use another measure of first contact, because this measure is, is somewhat conditioning on a success, right? There are other ways of, of trying to approach the labor market. And one, one supplementary measure is to say, either you've had positive earnings or you're registered with the PES. And then, of course, we see higher levels of first contact, especially during toward the end of the period when uh, registering at the PES became institutionalized for the majority of these migrants. The next step is to say, OK, so if we require something more on this labor market attachment, if we say, when did this person have his or her first real job? Something more similar to like working six months uh, on a low wage. Of course, the levels will then be lower. And we also here see the patterns that those who came in the 1990s had a pretty hard time. But after that, 
it is almost a remarkable stability of the patterns. Especially if we look in, like, say, at least a five-year perspective, the levels are very stable. And that is quite remarkable, I think, because if you think, I mean, first of all, the economy has varied a lot over this time. Uh, the business cycle has come and gone. And, and, and the number of people coming to Sweden and the countries of origin and the characteristics of the individuals has also varied. And still we see very stable patterns. So it's a, it's a pattern of slow but steady uh, labor market entry. Uh, so the positive view on that is to say, okay, it seems like a very stable process. Now that we have a lot of people coming into Sweden trying to find their way into the labor market, chances are that their situation will not be much worse than those who came before. On the other hand, you could also argue that it has always been a slow process, at least for the last 25 years. But we also see major gender differences in this process. At a given point in time, there is almost 15, 20 percentage points difference in the fraction that have sort of taken this step into the labor market between men and women. Men enter much faster than women do. This table is an attempt to show, to set, split this process into different steps. And I think that there are, the main, there are two main takeaways from this table. One is to say, it seems that across cohorts, the time between immigration and the first contact varies more than the time between the first contract and what we label entry. So it seems that getting in touch with this very first employer is a really important step. Because we also see in the last column that the fraction that has his or her first job at the same employer where the first contact happened is very high and, and also quite stable. So then, of course, it becomes very important to ask, where are these, po these ports of entry? Which employers, which industries provide these opportunities to enter the labor market? And this, in this graph, we have taken the first contacts and entries observed in these years. So these are not the immigration cohorts. And then we've taken the industry with the highest average for these years is to the left of the respective panels. And then we need in each industry, you can trace the time pattern by looking at the sort of smaller bars. And what we see then is that there is a concentration to business services, dominated by cleaning services in this case, hotels and restaurants. That is rather industries where there are a lot of low-qualified service jobs. You also see a very dramatic development for manufacturing, which was a very important port of entry in the 1990s, not so much anymore. On the other hand, this is partly artificial, because as we know, there has been a lot of more outsourcing during this time period. So if you perhaps entered as a janitor, in a large manufacturing firm in the 1990s. Now you perhaps enter in a cleaning firm which is contracted by, by the manufacturing firm. So it's partly artificial, but it's still very dramatic. And also, if you look within the respective industries, you see that these service industries have increased their fraction over time. But there is also huge gender differences in these entry patterns. We see that Healthcare is a very big port of entry for women, not so much for men. Men instead historically entered a lot of, more often in, in the manufacturing industry and also in hotels and restaurants. You can compare this to the business services, where we, which is an important entry industry for both men and women, but there is no major gender difference there. And also, oh, this is really nice with state data messed up things, or I messed up state. I don't know. Uh, this is, relative earnings is not supposed to be there, uh, as you may have guessed. Um, but anyway, this is an attempt to, to take more narrowly defined groups of immigrants, 
defined by country of origin or region of origin and year of immigration, where we know that an inflow of humanitarian migration dominated. And also, that you, you may recall, that these are very different groups of individuals. Different ter- types of selection in terms of education level, uh, social status, um, reasons for immigrating to Sweden or, or, or fleeing to Sweden. Sweden. But we sti- see in the very long-term pattern, long-term, there is something of a convergence to an employment, relative employment level that is 15 to 20 pe- percentage points lower than comparable natives. And we also see something, although there is, it's, it's a bit more messy, for, for the relative earnings that it seems to sort of be moving towards some level that is stable but poorer than for other comparable workers. And I think that this sort of adds to this picture of regularities, that these different groups of migrants coming at different points in time seem to be performing relatively similarly in the longer term. Okay, to conclude then, The picture is that the labor market of entry of non-labor migrants has been slow for decades. It is quite stable. If anything, we see an improvement during these times that we can observe the long-term development. So this is not to say that those who came after, say, 2010 or 2015 are doing better than those who came a little earlier. We We don't observe them in the long term yet. And we will, be, we will be discussing these policy options and experiences more later. But I think it's notable to say that, well, if you look at the OECD or this MIPEX index, there is a rather positive assessment of Sweden's systems and policies. And, and to those who observe the outcomes, it might be, seem like a puzzling contrast, that we have really good systems, really good policies, but we're not that satisfied with the outcomes. And, and when we look at different policy measures and what they can bring and not bring, the boring, solu- the boring conclusion is that there is probably no Alexandrian solution. Everybody knows what an Alexandrian solution is? Yes, good. An educated crowd. Uh, <coughs> do you know the details of that? No, you don't. But, but <laughs> Neither do I. But we could look at Wikipedia or something. Uh, I think that the conclusion is that you have to consider measures targeting supply, demand, and matching. And on a final note, I would say that research suggests that policy matters. We need to know which ones to use, when, and why. And to learn this, we need to consider implementing policy to facilitate evaluation. And this is something that requires courage and persistence from politicians, uh, from implementing organizations, and from researchers. And in this Nordic context, I think that we should be aware that our Nordic neighbors, in many respects, have come further than Sweden in this dimension. And this is something we need to think of, because this is an area where more knowledge, functional policies, is extremely uh, valuable and needed. Thank you. Thank you so much. You can keep your head, head, for, um, head microphone for a few seconds. Is there anyone who has a comment or uh, a short question? Yes, please. Uh, you, Just, you, could, you could please wait for the microphone, please. Uh, I assume that you have used the conventional labor market statistics based on questionnaires rather than administrative data. I think it's worth pointing out that if you... And then you get a difference between natives and immigrants, about 10 percentage points. If you use administrative data instead, then, then the difference is about 20 percentage points. And there are, there are weaknesses in, in both types of statistics, but it's not obvious to me which one is the, the most reliable one. Be, because well, the statistics you use now, that I assume that people are regarded as employed if they work one hour per week? Uh, well, n- no, this is registered data. It this is, is registered. This is registered data, and in w- what we label the first contact, it re- it's one krona is enough. When we consider this, what we call the first job, 
it's uh, it's a higher threshold. It's actually half the median of the average earnings of a 45-year-old. So it's a more complicated measure. But it's we want something that is time consistent. But thank you for asking. <laughs> thank you for clarify that. Yeah, one we can one more short question on on Olaf's presentation over there, please. Um, there is a, a large please introduce yourself, Susanna. Uh, there is a larger skill gap between um, females. It seems like in the Nordic countries, and it seems like females in, in the Nordic countries are high, more highly skilled than actually men. Could it be that there is a bigger skill gap between females than there are between men, with uh, foreign-born and domestic-born? Is that the, sort of the yeah, solution uh, to the problem. <laughs> yes, I ha, had I had more time, I would have speculated a bit about the, the explanations for this huge gap. I think that there are many factors uh, affecting this. I don't know exactly about the former skills thing. It's something that is often mentioned as something. Uh, if you look at uh, if you look at data from the World Bank and you look at female labor force participation uh, in in the source countries that have provided a lot of immigration to Sweden in recent years. You see that there is a huge gap uh, in, in between the Nordic countries on the one hand and, and the major source countries on the other. Uh, to the extent that that, is, uh, uh, that reflects skills or, or traditions or, or family responsibilities, uh, I don't know. But the fact is that there is a huge gap in that. So I don't, but it, but it's a very important question, of course, trying to get that. What, why, what is driving this difference between men and women and, and how can we uh, affect that? Thank you for now, Olof. Uh, now we will turn uh, to Norway and we will listen to, to uh, what Bernd Bratzberg has to say about uh, the development in Norway. And as you heard, he is the senior researcher at Frisch Center in Oslo. Most welcome and give him a welcome applause. Well, thank you, uh, Helena. And uh, thanks very much for the invite. Um, good morning to, to all of you. Uh, so what I uh, brought along are, are some experiences from, from Norway when it comes to uh, uh, labor market integration of refugees. Uh, everything I have, to, I have to say here is based on joint work with uh, Odd Bernadom and Knut Röd. And in fact, uh, most of my slides will be taken from uh, an article that uh, Olof uh, pointed to earlier that, that, that appeared in the Nordic Economic Policy Review earlier this year. Uh, I, I should point out, though, that Coming here, I, I updated. I had one more year worth of data, so I, I updated the data series that I used. So it's not everything sort of matches completely. But and I, in between, I'll, I'll make some references to other work that we've been doing recently on <coughs> refugee immigration, or I'm sorry, refugee uh, uh, labor market integration and or integration of of immigrants from low income countries in more general. Um, to uh, to start off, uh, a lot of what I have to say will be very negative. So, so I'll have a very sort of negative flavor to pretty much everything that I'm presenting. So, so I want to start with a positive note, and that is that we come from a tradition where we view, we hail international immigration or na international migration for the uh, economic efficiency gains that 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 we could get from seeing people move across countries. So it's it's a big thing. Uh, uh, but we're realistic enough to, to, to acknowledge that when we look across host countries, particularly in Europe, we'll see that, that immigrant groups from, from low-income countries and refugees in particular do not do all that well in the labor market, which contrasts a bit with, with the stylized fact from the other side of the Atlantic, which says that refugees, they have great assimilation rates into the economy, into the labor market, by far higher assimilation rates than other migrant groups. And, and these studies that, that, that have been looking at this, they, they always point to human capital accumulation. They point to the fact that refugees have a much longer time horizon in the host country than, than other uh, immigrants. And for that reason, they have, they have great incentive to invest in language, to invest in schooling. Uh, so when we turn to, to Europe, at first glance, it looks like the evidence is a little bit more mixed. Uh, I did, just like Olaf did, I, 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 I picked a, a picture from, or a figure from the OECD. Uh, but I, uh, here, I, I, it, it has a different sort of message from, from the one that Olaf had, because uh, 
I'm, I'm looking here at refugees, employment rates of refugees in, in 2014, and, and other uh, immigrants from, from non-EU countries. And, and uh, two things to point out here. Uh, Norway sits very close to the EU average. We're talking about employment rates of 55 and 60% for those two groups, which aren't particularly good. If we look to Sweden, we'll see that Sweden is doing better, particularly when it comes to refugee employment, than Norway. So, so you know, there is a question whether, as a policymaker in Sweden, whether you want to look to Norway at all uh, for good advice as to how to uh, get refugees integrated in the labor market. The consolation for me is that if we look further east than we look to Finland, we're, we're looking, yeah, things are really rosy in Norway. Uh, so Denmark is missing for some reason from this, this graph. I, I, I don't know. Uh, so, so low employment rates of, of immigrants, but just as in the U.S. Uh, evidence, it appears when you take these labor force survey data and look at how refugees do over time, so you follow them over time, the time since, since arrival, it looks like things improve very rapidly. So here's a, a, a graph that I, I picked from, from a publication by Dustman et al., where they're looking at EU labor force survey data from 2008. And the, the horizontal line here, the red bar, that sort of represents natives. All right, so the zero line is natives. And the question is, what is the employment gap between refugees in the dark uh, line and, and natives, and how does that evolve over time, the time since, since arrival? And as you can see, employment gaps are, are large to begin with. We're talking 50, 60 percent employment gaps, differences uh, in employment rates. But they fade over time. And when we get sort of 20 years or, or more after, after arrival, it appears that even in Europe, refugees do well, and it seems like they, they certainly reach the level of other uh, immigrant groups. Now, these are our cross-section data, uh, and, and, and there may be some problems with that. When, when we move to, to the Nordic studies on this, we, we have one major strength, and that is that we have the registers that we could look at. So we could, take, we could take individuals and follow them, track them over time, and see how they do, and we, we, we get around a lot of, a lot of issues that you will have with, with the cross-sectional studies. So that's what we do in this uh, article that I uh, referred to. Uh, we, we take uh, all immigrants arriving to Norway since 99, very similar to what, what Olaf did, actually. Uh, we take those who are sort of reasonably young adults as they arrive, and then we just follow them over time and see, see how they do. Uh, the, the two tweaks that we do in here is that we're concerned with refugees versus other types of immigrants. And the other is we're, we're concerned about how movements go into the labor market, that is, to, into a state of employment, or how they relate to the welfare system, whether or not immigrants over time move into or out of social insurance as their prime source of, of income. Wow, my graph looked okay, didn't it? <laughs> I, I, I feared the worst. When I saw Lop's graphs, I, I really feared what was going to happen with this one. But it, uh, <laughs> uh, so just to put this thing in, in a little bit of perspective, uh, these are, since 1990, immigrant arrivals to Norway uh, through 2016. The two groups that I'll focus on in my talk are the green and the orange groups, refugees, and mostly their family uh, members arriving a little bit later. Uh, as you can see, they're, 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 it's a, I mean, a sizable inflow, but it's not huge. It's not like it's a dominating, dominating uh, so, or, or uh, class of, of admission in, in a Norwegian context. The, the thing about refugees and, and family migrants, though, is that they tend to stay over time. So if we look sort of 10 years down the line, you'll find that typically 85% are still in Norway. While for all the other groups, the probability that they're still in Norway is much, much lower. So it means that refugees and family immigrants will make a larger footprint as far as the 
demographic makeup of the country. So if we look at immigrant shares, and how they have evolved since 1990 until up until today, we'll see that the overall immigrant share of the Norwegian population, here it's the adult population, has increased from, from 5% to almost 20%. That's a huge, by any, any international standard, that's a huge, huge uh, change in immigrant share. A quadrupling over, over the, you know, 25 years or so. That, that's a lot. If we take that, uh, and, and what we'll see here is that, that the relative uh, uh, footprint of, of family and refugee migrants uh, is a little bit larger than what we saw in the inflow figures. If we take that adult population and look at whether their main source of income is from work, that is the employed population, or from social insurance transfers, the welfare population, then we'll see that the green and the orange groups are underrepresented in employment and severely overrepresented in the welfare population. And this is sort of what we would like to understand. So, so we start off with the integration process, try to understand or try to first figure out what does that relationship look like. Is this just reflecting a cross-section uh, picture that m refugees do poorly to begin with and then they do much better over time, like we saw in the US and the, and the European evidence. Um, now the one thing that's a little bit special uh, about uh, Norway and I'd say Nordic countries is that, that when you get into the labor market, you will also get entitlement to social insurance programs, much more so than, than in other host countries. So, so it, it's not quite clear that the integration process that we've seen from other countries is the same picture that we'll see over here. So uh, when we do this, we'll take, like Olaf did, we'll take cohorts arriving over a long 25 years or so, uh, will observe their employment, etc. outcomes over a 23-year period, uh, we'll get an awful lot of data points. And when we take the employment, each year after arrival, we take and look at the fraction whose main source of income is employment and just trace that out for refugees in the green line over here, We'll see that in Norway, as well as in other countries, very low employment rates immediately after arrival. There's a real good news of rapid integration into the labor market. Over some very few years, that employment rate rises dramatically. But then what we see in this picture is somewhat puzzling. It reaches a, 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 an apex, and then it appears to be declining. Certainly for men, a little bit less for women. But if you look at the family immigrant groups, we have the same picture there. So it looks like over time that employment is declining with, with years since migration. So what is this? Uh, is it just an aging thing? So after 20 years, all these guys are going to be 20 years older than they were when they arrived. So, so maybe that's what's going on. Uh, so to answer that question, we need a much larger st statistical framework. We need to control for, for all sorts of stuff that has to do with aging, cohort heterogeneity, country of origin effects, period effects, lots of stuff. And what do we get then? Well, we get a picture that's even worse. So this is the same picture as the one that I, I picked from, lifted from, from Dustman et al. to begin with, that looks at the difference or the employment differential between a native, that's represented by the horizontal zero line, and a refugee immigrant in, in the solid, solid line over here. And just as in the Dustman study, we'll find that employment rates to begin with, where the differential is large, 55 percentage points, the first few years after arrival. But then it declines very, very, very quickly. But after six years, it reaches 18 percentage points. And after that, it widens. So this is... One picture where Norway differs a lot from other, other host countries around. After five years, six years for, for refugee men, after nine years for refugee women, employment rates start to drop. And they fall relative to 
to the native with similar characteristics, the employment gap widens over time by 10 percentage points. So a key lesson from this is that in the Norwegian experience, um, the, 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 there's a rapid integration process in the labor market, but it comes to a halt, and then it, then it reverses. Um, so, so, so one takeaway from this is that we can do a lot better than we do. Because we've seen these people in the labor market, we've seen them work. So, 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 so why, why, why not? So, so this is what we've been trying to understand. Um, how much I forgot to how much time do I have? Well, another five minutes. <laughs> I do have five minutes. That's really excellent. So, 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 why does this thing take place? Well, well, one thing we see is that the process accelerates greatly during during economic downturns. So, so immigrant jobs disappear quicker than others. They're, they're, they're more exposed to bankruptcies. They're more exposed to major downsizing than than natives. And and when they lose the job, the consequences of job loss is more severe for refugee migrants than for other groups. That is, they stay longer in unemployment. They have a greater tendency to get into, first, uh, the, the unemployment insurance system, then on to other welfare programs that has to do with temporary disability, and then eventually into permanent disability. Uh, some of that process surely reflects uh, mismatches in, in human capital. So there's probably some, some policy thing here where we could do something about that, that human capital. Uh, I pointed to this, but, but, but we also find that, that immigrants are much more sensitive to, uh, to benefits, both for benefits, than, than natives are. So, so that, that decision, if you have that decision, of, of whether to, to go on welfare or to, to look for a job, you know, that's, that's a much closer call for the typical refugee migrant than it is for the native. So, so we'll get back to the policies, but, but there's a long-term perspective that needs to be in here. So, so Helena asked me to, isn't there something that works in Norway? Can't I point to something that's worked? And, and, and the thing is, we see in the data that, that those who have been through the Norwegian education system somehow, those who have been employed early in the process, maybe even before they were formally admitted, they do better. But, but we don't know whether this is causal or whether it's just a correlation yet. We, we have some ideas how we could explore it. The, the two things that we have looked at in the causal Light are two, two very small, tiny things that have to do with these are like typical stick stick type measures. Uh, requirements, subsistence requirements for family reunification, uh, activation requirements for those who, who apply for social assistance seem to work a little bit, but these are like little drops. I mean, they, they, they barely make very little difference uh, in, in the big picture. The big program for integrating refugees in Norway is the introduction program. Uh, so I'll, I'll just wind up that it's talking a couple minutes about the integration program, or the introduction program, which, which is a, a two or three year program that every refugee since 2004, well really since 2003, the 2003 cohort qualified when the program was first introduced, uh, they receive a salary of, of 187,000 Norwegian kroners a year to go through a training program that should prepare them for the labor market, that should prepare them for a life uh, of economic self-sufficiency. What we've done is looked at in a difference in differences framework. So, so there is a clear treatment group, it's refugees and family migrants that, that, that qualify for this. It turns out there's a lot of immigrants coming to Norway from the same countries that do not qualify for the introduction program for some reason or another. They could be a control group in a difference and different setup if we wanted to. We have, so what we're doing here, we're looking at some pre-reform cohorts and we're looking at some post-reform cohorts and we could follow those over time. Let me show you the picture when it comes to employment of those groups. So here we have the treatment groups for men and women. So these are refugees arriving in the orange squares they're arriving around 2000. Those we could track here for, for 14, 15 years. We see their employment rates, how they take along. Then we have those arriving after the introduction of the 
after the introduction of the introduction program. That was, yeah. uh, not intended. Uh, and we could see that, not surprisingly, their employment rates are really low for the first two or three years because that's when they're in, on, on the program, right? They're, they're, they have to be in the classroom, so they're not employed. And then in years four and five, we see a, a positive effect of the introduction program on their employment rates. And, and in those who have listened to me before will have heard me talk very, very favorably about this program, and that's because then my data series stopped right here. <laughs> and I was like, wow, we finally we found something that worked. But then now we could follow them a little bit longer, and what do we see? Pretty much zero. Pretty much a zero long-run effect of this massive effort in schooling and training of refugee immigrants. That, that is for men. For women, there's actually something going on. There, there, there's something there. See that? There, there's something there. Uh, I'm not going to talk so much about the, the control groups because we don't really need them. But, but if, we, if we run a massive regression and control for country of birth and all sorts of things you could think of, we, we could estimate the effect of the program on refugee employment. And what we find is not surprisingly negative effect at first while they're in the program, the first three years. But then we find positive effects years four and five, as I said, and then nothing for men, a little bit positive for women. So the question now is, so these employment effects, one thing, but is that training, does it enhance their human capital? Does it get them into better jobs? That is like a key question. And, and, and another question is, are they better off than they were before, economically? So, so I'm going to look at two additional measures, earnings and after-tax income. And if we look at earnings, first we'll see, no, there's nothing really going on other than what we saw in the employment figures for refugee men. And for women, we'll find, yeah, similar, similar things that we saw for employment. They're doing a little bit better. Uh, and, and if we formally estimate the effects of the program, we'll see that it's, there's like nothing in the long term for men, but there's some positive effects for refugee women. So perfect. Are they better off in the long term? We could look at after-tax income from all sorts of sources, including welfare benefits. And what we're finding then, yes, refugee women are much better off, or at least they're better off than they were before. So the introduction program in Norway has been a great benefit to refugee women, but had zero effect on refugee men. I'll finish there. Thank you. Please pick it up. Oops. Uh, just a few follow-up questions. I think we are all a little bit surprised about the the um, the change after five years. People dr- seems to drop out from the labor market, even though they have been uh, going through introduction programs and so on. Uh, and you you explain it with with the business cycle, but is that the whole thing? Is or, or are there other reasons that you can think of? Uh- are you are you asking me, or is yes, that a question from the audience, or, or mm, okay, <laughs> yeah, so so yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the 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 jobs that they uh, so they end up in, in jobs coming out of these programs, but that they're, they're not jobs that last. So it's uh, but in, is that independence of uh, independent of if they have got education or introduction or. In, Regardless of where they come from, for for instance. Okay, so so what I've been showing you are, are average pictures, right? So so you're saying that oh yeah, there's got to be a lot of heterogeneity under there. But for each time you find someone that's doing very positive, you got to find someone that's negative for the average to be to be zero, right? So but so yeah, so but true, true. Yeah. Is there a difference between people coming from different countries? Uh, in in terms of the introduction program itself. Well, in terms of this change, I mean, this this the description that you 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 showed us that that uh, people d- tend to drop out from the labor market. Uh, yeah, that's no, I, I can't answer that question. Mm-hmm. Do we have any uh, any more follow up question on on this? Yes, over there, please. Okay. Uh, Donald Rhodes from Stockholm University. So one potential story could be uh, the, that highly educated people take low-skill jobs to start with, and at the time they don't like being a cab driver. Or could that be a potential thing going on? 
yeah, so so you're pointing to the the evidence to some extent reflecting the mismatch in, of education, um, and that also comes to play in that decision over the long haul whether or not what sort of effort you should should make into staying in the labor market. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that's uh, one short part question of the over here, and then we will continue with the next speaker. Um, I was just curious if you've had any chance to to look into the mechanism for the positive earnings effect for women. Is it that they find better jobs or more stable jobs? Yeah, so what we see here is that they're they're more likely to be in employment. Uh, I, I, so... I'll be a little bit careful because I haven't looked that deeply into it, but... but there's a lot of public sector employment as well for for these uh, for for these refugee women that that we didn't see ten years ago. So uh, yeah, those are more stable jobs for sure. Yeah. Thank you so far, uh, Bert, and then we will move over to to Denmark and Marie Louise. Marie Louise is the uh, senior researcher at the Rockwall Foundation in Copenhagen. Most welcome, and give her a warm applause. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my presentation is also uh, well based on uh, more or less uh, the same study as uh, the two former speakers, and then a little bit extra since then. Um, and we will move fast forward because we've got 15 minutes. Um, so uh, what you see here is uh, newly arrived immigrants in Denmark in 1997. And um, <clears throat> it looks a bit like the graph we saw earlier from, from Norway. Um, um, what you see here, different. yeah, the colors are different. And also the, the, the share of refugees and family re reunified is a bit different. Uh, it's a bit uh, smaller as far as I can see, especially the later years. The point here is that in the beginning of the period, we see that refugees and family reunified to refugees, there are around... Uh, they do constitute to around uh, uh, half of uh, the newly arrived immigrants, while the others come to study, be employed, or come from other EU uh, countries. And then I must mention that the Nordic countries here are discriminated. They're not even here because they don't need a residence permit to come. So this is only immigrants arriving with a residence permit. Okay. But if you see after 2001, you see a drop in the number of refugees and family reunified. And I'll explain that in a minute. And then you can see that the later years, much more immigrants have arrived. But the share of refugees and family re the reunified has uh, become much uh, lower. And uh, part of the explanation for that, at least is probably due to uh, reforms in the Aliens Act that we had in 2002 that made it harder for refugees to come. The de facto refugee status was abolished, and instead there was this stricter uh, and more difficult status, B status, to obtain. And at the same time, it was also made harder uh, to qualify for being a family reunified. Um, speaking about integration programs, then the biggest change... Here uh, was back in 99, where the integration program was prolonged from one and a half year to three years. And also that we have had uh, quite a lot of periods where we have lower social benefits for newly arrived. Um, <clears throat> and that these periods are the same periods as we have right-wing governments. So they tend to shift that every time we shift from left to right-wing. Um, that's have somehow become a tradition. Um, going to the employment rates, uh, well, um, here you see more or less uh, graph, uh, uh, very much like uh, the Norwegian one. So I was surprised the first time I saw the Norwegian graph because I've been looking at my own graph from the refugee men here where you see the first picture. And this is simply the employment rate, and here shown for years since migration. And you will see the drop that we were discussing before. It's also seen for refugee men in Denmark after these seven and eight years, where around 55% uh, are employed. Then we see uh, 
this decline. Where, um, and I should mention that refugees here is both uh, refugees and refugees uh, or family reunified to refugees, but doesn't make a big difference uh, once we decompone it on men and women. So I've just put them together here. While if you see the family reunified uh, to, to other immigrants, which are often people coming from Turkey and Pakistan, um, then we see a, a much higher employment rate for the men uh, and very much like the one for, for low-skilled natives. Uh, while if we look at all natives, uh, the percentage here is higher. And the reason for me to bring these two lines is that I don't have exact educational information, or at least I didn't have it when we made uh, this study. So um, that's why I compared the other way around, uh, so to speak. Uh, if we look at the women, we see that uh, the employment is uh, lower for refugees and also for family reunified. Um, but we don't see the same uh, decline. It's just um, a, a much more slow process, um, generally. If we do regressions and control of demographic characteristics and labor market characteristics, a year of arrival and so forth, uh, then we can do uh, uh, make these uh, predicted employment gaps uh, which is also very closely related to what you saw before in the Norwegian uh, study. Here I've just put in some specific years. And uh, you will see that we have, uh, again, we have this uh, huge uh, gap in uh, employment the first years. And then uh, later on, it becomes uh, less pronounced. But then again, after 10 years, we see an increasing gap uh, once more uh, uh, and the point here is, which I should have mentioned, of course, is that here we compare all the different groups with refugees. So uh, refugees are less employed than all other groups. Um, and that's also what we see on the picture for, for women where, with the, the cohort there. Um, this is the first cohort we are looking at, those who arrived from uh, 97 to 2001 and the reason here, of course, is, is that that's the only group I can follow for 15 or 17 years. Um, but if we look at it, like, uh, how does the first cohort do compared with the other cohorts? If we look at the picture after five years of stay, there we can see that, well, it seems like the second cohort uh, dis, uh, did best, especially if we look at the men, why the pattern is less clear for women. Um, if we look at uh, the predicted earnings gap in exactly the same uh, way, then we will see, uh, well, more or less much of the same picture. If we look at years since migration, that, um, that it is, of course, uh, if we compare with the low-skilled natives, then we see that, that the, the earnings gaps uh, converge at least until 10 years, and then it increases again. Um, but we can also see that that we never really the refugees never catch up uh, with the other groups, um, and uh, and and that's um, very clear also uh, also uh, for for the women. If we kind of turn no another thing I should mention here is that. If we look, when we look at the gap here, when we look at the earnings gap, you can see that the gap is, is larger for men than for women. Uh, while when we were looking at employment, it was the opposite. And the reason here is especially that, that native men, more educated or not than the women, they earn more than native women. So that's why we get a huge gap there, while the employments, the types of employment that refugees has are typically in, in low-skilled jobs and where it doesn't really get much better after 10 or 15 years of employment, while this is not the case for the natives. So that's why we see this uh, picture here. If we look at transfer income, well, it's kind of the opposite side of, <laughs> of the coin here. And uh, now you see that we get a negative gap, meaning that refugees are those who receive the most. 
Um, but the picture is uh, very much uh, the same. We see that the gap is declining for the men until around after 10 years, and then it increases again. And, of course, the, the, the really puzzling question here is, what is going on uh, after these years? And we discussed it as well for a minute ago, and I've also been looked something into it, and I was thinking, well, how about um, early retirement benefit? And uh, so if I take exactly uh, the same graph as you saw in the beginning where we look at employment rates, I've taken exactly the same population here. Now I just have uh, looked at how many uh, received uh, early retirement benefit in Danish called Fertispension. So this is a kind of pension that you can uh, receive if you are if you are disabled and uh, uh, not able to work. And you can clearly see that, especially for the men here, the take-up rate, uh, the refugee men the take-up rate is really high. It's almost 30% uh, that receive this. So this is definitely where at least <laughs> some of the men um, go. Um, and you can also see that for family reunified with migrants, this is not the case at all. Of course, we can speculate in what is uh, the differences here. And, and clearly, there are some can be some health problems related to being a refugee, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and so forth that could be part of it. Um, but it's also clear that these types of benefits are sometimes also received by a system where you're after 10, 15 years of an unemployment perhaps, well, nobody knows really what to do next, so you end up on early uh, retirement benefit. That's another possibility. And another thing that might also play a role here is that this benefit is a bit higher than some of the other benefits. So if we're looking about the incentives gaps, then it could certainly play a role here too. And, uh, well, we can't really see anything about that directly from the numbers. But if I take these same graphs and look for the refugees based on cohorts, you can see that something here, something is going on. The first two cohorts... They look more or less the same. But the third cohort, it looks like something is going on here. Suddenly, <laughs> the, the, the share that receive early retirement benefit is, is, uh, looks like it's going uh, to be lower. And um, I haven't really uh, looked deeply into this yet, but I think a, a potential <laughs> explanation could be that we had an early retirement reform in 2013, making it much harder for people under the age of 14 to become electable for, for um, the early retirement benefit. Uh, so that could be a reason uh, for, uh, for this uh, to happen. Um, but as I said, we don't... This is, of course, interesting, and one could speculate in, well, if people are not, if these refugees now are no longer able to receive early retirement benefit, will more of them go into employment? Well, who knows if, if, they are, if their health, in a way, allows it, then, then yes or perhaps no, but this is still speculations. We, we don't really know. Um, uh, What we do know a little about if we talk about documented effects, and I must say my orange lines here, they go completely crazy. But um, uh, anyway, it doesn't affect uh, the studies. Uh, so uh, what you see here is that uh, at least we have found earlier on uh, positive employment effects in a number of ways. I mean, I would very much <laughs> stress that It, it's it's clearly difficult to be able to to have the right match, so to speak, for refugees and with the, la the Danish labor market. So we haven't got any really smart solution that the Swedish uh, audience should copy right away. But what we have seen that seems to work, at least uh, to some extent, is um, the active labor market programs. Um, some of um, the early ones there uh, looked as it, it's bringing uh, people closer to employment and closer to firms. Um, uh, and 
We have also seen that these uh, jobs with wage subsidies in, this, in the private sector has some positive effects. Um, we also have a couple of studies showing that actually lowering the benefits and making economic incentive to take a job um, more uh, efficient uh, also makes employment higher for some persons. And also there are studies showing that, that network effects are important. It's important for refugees to know somebody, uh, countrymen, or it, in, in principle it could be others, but these study points to, to countrymen that, that had helped them in employment. Um, if we're thinking about what has uh, recent changes been in, in, uh, in Danish politics, um, well, it's uh, definitely uh, stricter access uh, also during the, the, the refugee crisis. Uh, Danish politicians steering very fixed to the Swedish border and uh, seeing what was going on there. And um, it has become <clears throat> much, mar much harder to become family reunified. Now it takes three years before you can send in the application as a refugee. There are also lowering benefits uh, once more, you could say. <laughs> um, and um, there has been a change in, uh, in uh, the integration program, putting more focus to the employment part. Um, and this is as a result of uh, some negotiations in the spring uh, 2016 where the government and the employers and the unions decided that <clears throat> to, to make a, a deal about this, um, kind of trying to get this match to work better because uh, many refugees that arrive uh, to Denmark uh, do not uh, really possess the skills that the Danish labor market needs, not right away at least. So um, this agreement was a way to try and say, okay, we companies can take in refugees for up to two years and uh, the refugees are not going to, <laughs> going to receive large sums, but they're going to have the connection with the firm, hopefully being able to stay there after these two years. And the firms are allowed to have people for kind of like a trainee salary, so it's cheaper for them to have them, and the union has accepted this as long as it's only for these two years. So that's uh, the agreement that has been made. It had, had been a very slow start, not that many companies kind of uh, took in people, but right now it's around 1,000 refugees who are part of the program. So it's um, more than it has been. And to sum up, uh, you've seen that the flow of refugees to Denmark has varied significantly over time, that refugees improve uh, their labor market participation within the first years of their stay in Denmark, but also that they do not catch up with natives, uh, not in general or low-skilled and nor with family reunified to other immigrants. And after a decade, it seems like the men are falling behind and end up take uh, early retirement pension, at least some of them. Um, the, as I was discussing before, the employment gap is larger for uh, refugee men and women than for men, uh, and it's the opposite with the earnings. And um, it looked like the employment gap was smallest for the second cohort, and looking at the men, and the transfer incomes are in generally higher for refugee men than others. So um, that's thank you so much, Nancy. <laughs> Uh, I think it's interesting because we see the si same tendency both in Norway and Denmark with, with the people falling out after, after a few years. Is that only due to this early retirement uh, reason that you pointed out or, or is there another background as well? I, I guess, I mean, basically we only see what the employment away is. We can't, I can't say exactly what the reason is, but... Um, uh, something, of course, that I've also worried about is this about how the business cycle. I mean, tr try to control for that. But, of course, that could be part of it. And it's clearly also in Denmark that there is this tendency that refugees are those who get kind of the last available jobs. Uh, and they're also 
Also, when you look at where refugees, the employment they get into now, it's often those firms that are not able to acquire other uh, other empl employees. And these employees might not like these kind of firms because they think that that these firms are not safe enough. So it is like also part of a, a circle that the the problem is that as long as you are kind of part of, of the weakest part of the Uh, the labor, then uh, you will sit in these weaker positions, so you will be more vulnerable to huh. to business cycles and other things going on. Um, so I think that's that's part of part of it as well. Marilise, uh, could you please move over there, and then I will sure. ask Olaf and Bernd to to join us uh, at this stage, and we will continue now the the discussion. What I think is uh, would be interesting to hear. I mean, uh, this is not the first time that you meet uh, and you've read the, your common paper before. But what what is your your um, uh, most important takeaway from from you, Olaf? What you have heard from from Denmark and Norway? Well, I think that this pattern that I mean, if you look at these studies and other statistics, you can see that it seems that the, the transition into employment or into the labor market is somewhat slower in Sweden at first, and, and then, but in the long term, it seems that in relative ter terms, people are doing slightly better in Sweden. I, I think that this, these papers were the first ones to really establish that this difference might be there, but the next step is, of course, trying to understand what is going on, and I think that we are not there, but, but it's... Uh, It's of course very appealing to consider. I mean, given that these the Nor Norwegian, the Danish, and the Swedish welfare states are quite similar, there seems to be some differences in in the systems and how they work that we would like to exploit and understand further to to really figure out what what drives the developments that we see. Yeah, Marilis, what do you take take away from from listening to to the Swedish example and and the Norwegian example? Well, I think. At first, I was most surprised to see that the Norwegian result was actually looking <laughs> a bit like what I had from Denmark. But then afterwards, of course, it has been puzzling to think about what is Sweden doing better? Why does it seem like you are better at keeping people, the refugees, keeping a hold on the labor market? Why they seem to uh, uh, earlier to kind of leave uh, employment in Denmark? Um, and Bant, what, what is your takeaway from from listening to the other two? Yeah, it's the uh, I, I have to echo what uh, Marie Louise is saying. Uh, it's it's amazing how parallel, how com I mean, common pictures we get from Denmark and Norway. Uh, so so they obviously been on the same road as far as mm. as, as uh, refugee uh, integration. Sweden seems to be doing a little bit better over the long haul. Uh, I think Olaf is, is, likes to look across the, the fence and say, <laughs> and say that everything is greener over there, but, but I, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm not coming here to sell any of the Norwegian programs anyway. So what but, but, what but, we heard is that the, the employment rate of, of uh, refugees is, is on a low and stable level in, in Sweden. And, and I would like to, to ask Olaf, because in this very moment, in fact, not right now at 11 o'clock, the unions and the uh, employers are signing uh, another measure that is introduced now to, to help to, to, um, to support the possibilities for refugees to get into the labor market. And it's called Etableringsjobb or Etableringslö. Etablerings uh, you have heard about it, I suppose, Olaf. What, what is your reaction on, on, on that? Will that be well, a, I, a big I, solution? <laughs> given that you say that, that, I mean, there is no one solution, I think that anything that all parties can agree upon and that works is, is a good thing. But uh, uh, as a labor economist, to me, I mean, I don't know the details of this particular suggestion, uh, but, but it seems that all ideas floating around have some, some things in common. One is that, I mean, there is some sort of lowering for the, the hiring cost for, for the employer. Uh, it is temporary. It typically includes something, a training or education component, and the government also has to chip in. Uh, and and that, um, I think that, that that is something in common here. Uh, we know that, that subsidized employment, we see, saw that in the 
Danish and Norwegian presentations, I mean, for the individual, having some sort of subsidized or, I mean, any sort of connection to the employer is, is a really important thing. So in that perspective, it's, it's positive. And of course, there is a, uh, a political and a bargaining component to all these uh, discussions, and, uh, which I don't know much about. But, uh, but you also said to me when we talked about this before this, this seminar, you said that, that the employers, they don't use the possibility to, to hire people to a low salary, even if they, they got, got different possibilities. Well, well, that is, I mean, the observation is that we've had very generous subsidies targeted at, at recent migrants for a very long time, and we, o- we have only seen limited uh, use of that. And, of course, you can discuss the causes for that. It might be that people with employers think that these subsidies are not attractive enough, that they don't want to be dependent on the government and things like that. But, of course, in a general uh, perspective, we think that this is free money, and we think that, that employers and firms would be attracted to the possibility of cut, cutting their costs and increasing their profits. That's sort of a basic driving force, we think, for, for uh, firms. Uh, so, so I think that one should be sort of realistic uh, when, when thinking about the, how big the potential for these types of contracts is and also the interaction between, for example, lowering the cost and the need for improving matching and exposure between potential employers and potential employees. Uh, I will just turn to, there is a representative for one of the employees' organizations over, over there. Could you, could you have a microphone? I just wanted to hear very short if, why you think this will be more attractive to the employers than, than the other programs before. Hello, I'm, my name is Peter Thornqvist. I'm from Teknik för Tagen. Uh, well, very shortly, it's exactly what you were discussing there, Olaf. We think that uh, the problem has been that uh, prior subsidies have uh, been too uh, administ- administrative burdensome for the companies. Uh, while they do uh, lower the hiring costs, it involves uh, complicated for the companies, complicated uh, procedures where they have to uh, uh, basically pay out money and wait for a reimbursement for the state which uh, is a problem from, uh, for, for costs and also when it comes to liquidity of the companies. Our um, suggestion, what is now being discussed, would be a, a subsidy that goes directly to the individual employee, thereby cutting out the need for uh, administrative burdens for the companies and also uh, making sure that, that the money is not t- taken from the company and then they have to wait for some kind of subsidy being paid by the government to them. Uh, So we cut out the companies, basically. And we think that this is going to be attractive for for our members. Thank you so much. Uh, Bernd, when you you were describing the introduction program in in Norway, is this uh, this a way to go, you think? Is it similar to what you already have in Norway? And what's your experiences? No, it's it's actually quite different. So so you, you... so, so this is a general question here, whether you should train first and then place in the labor market or whether you should place first and then train a little bit. And, and, and since 2004, the Norwegian, you know, everything has been gone into train first and then, then see what happens uh, and, and, and get the refugees into a job for, at any cost. Uh, and, and it hasn't been very successful um, or, or, or not, not hugely successful at least. Um, so, so where could we go from there? Well, uh, I personally like the the uh, wage subsidy schemes. I, I think that's that has a lot to do. Uh, when when I look at these cohorts that I I, I put up at the and here we we had a enormous run up of the Norwegian economy, the Norwegian labor market in the mid two thousands, leading up to the financial crisis that, that hardly hit us at all, by the way. But but still, wages and employment, everything grew grew tremendously. But at that time, those newly arrived refugees were forced to sit, sit in the classroom and, and, and weren't even allowed to go out there and look for, for a job when, when the jobs were there. Uh, so so that's, that's, that's a huge dilemma. Uh, at the same time, I, I, I'm, those, when I talk about the, the, the failure of the introduction program, as the way I can describe it right now, uh, to those who are real proponents of it. They say, well, that just shows that two years isn't enough or three years isn't enough. We need to double the effort. And, and yeah, I, I, absolutely. I, 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 I do not disagree with that at all. It's, it's definitely not an effort we, we should give up on. marie what, what what's your view on, on the, all the efforts that, that are on the table? What, what works and what, what doesn't work? 
<clears throat> well, it's the the this uh, change in the Danish politics is so new, so we don't have any evaluation of it yet. But I mean, t- taking the picture that what happened having a three year program and where we are still not that successful, then of course it could be. It, it seems like these uh, these earlier studies show that there could be something in putting people earlier into contact with with companies, because that's part of the package that they that they uh, miss. But, of course, uh, qualifications is also an issue here. We just uh, finished a study here this uh, summer where we have uh, uh, been out interviewing 66,000 uh, immigrants in Denmark and including a lot of refugees. And in the refugee group, um, more than half of them didn't have 12 years of schooling. Mm. And, I mean, that tells something about... And you're entering to a Danish labor market that is very much asking for high-qualified um, labor. So there's definitely a thing to do about uh, qualifications as well. Um, and whether to do it one way or the other can be tricky because the the problem... It, it seems obvious that you need some training. The problem is, are you going to do it within firms or as we described earlier in these integration programs? Because the 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 problem might also be that if you go heavily into employment right now and here in the firms that needs uh, that leads uh, labor now, then if you don't improve your language skills, if you don't have the proper education along the way, then you might exactly uh, be the first one that's thrown out when the next crisis arrives or if you lose your job, then you're completely unable to get the next job. Mm. So it's tricky. It's tricky, yeah. We understand that, I think. <laughs> Is there anyone who, who wants to, to comment or add, uh, ask a question? Please. Hello, uh, my name is Matthias Åberg. I'm a CEO of a cleaning company located here in Sweden. So I'm sort of the other end of the, all the statistics we've been viewing. And uh, it took until 11.20 uh, that someone mentioned language. Uh, from my perspective, I, see, I work every day with uh, my employer, employees. Uh, it's all sort of difficulties we have because we love to employ people, uh, is always uh, connected to, to a language. There's no question about it. Because we can train anyone to become a good cleaner. No problem. We do that every day. But the language issue is constantly there. If you don't speak Swedish in Sweden, you have difficulties. Uh, how do we train people? How do we interact with customers? How do we... Uh, communicate uh, safety instructions, etc., etc. And I think uh, any program that will uh, make it easier for companies like uh, the one I'm representing, uh, any program that does not include language as a training, focused uh, uh, training, will never succeed. May I, just, may I just ask you, how do you handle this now then, then when we have the situation with a lot of people who don't know the Swedish language and I suppose that you employ a lot of those people anyway how do you handle it how, how do you work with it it's 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 very difficult uh, honestly uh, I, around 90 percent of uh, the people who work at my company are from another uh, country uh, the most uh, Spanish is the most common language uh, it is very difficult because uh, in one way, I think all of you mentioned that the cleaning job is easy, low qualified. Everyone says so, but but it's not true when it comes to, for example, safety instructions uh, and things like that. So uh, we try. Sometimes it, 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 one way is that uh, uh, our arbetsleder or whatever that is in in uh, in English. Uh, the one who actually employs the people, uh, they usually are from the same sort of language section. So if you have a guy from South America, he usually, uh, a manager from South yeah. America, he employs people from South America so they can actually communicate. But that's not a structured way. It is difficult, so I have no good answer. We sort of struggle by because the 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 the, the, um, the alternative does not exist. No. We do as good as we can, but it is very difficult, and it's the biggest challenge by far for us. Thank you so much. What, what do you say, Olaf, the biggest cha- challenge? Yes, and first of all, I, I 
I can't judge. It's just using sort of a typical level of uh, typical classification for types of, of jobs and industries. So it's not implying that some jobs are simpler or, or easier to do than others. But but um, in terms of language, I think that yes, this has been going back and forth, and we have a long tradition of of saying that first you get the language and then you go to the labor market. And this has the experience is that this has taken a very very long time. And now, of course, focus is sort of shifting and saying a job first and then learn the language when when you're at the employer. Uh, I think that what what you say is very interesting to to, to listen to, and also that it uh, strengthens me in in the the view that uh, we should not lose focus, at least not in the long term, on the importance of of mastering and learning the the host country language. It is a very important component in that. Um, but on the other hand, if it's, it's always on the one hand and on the other. Uh, last week, I talked to somebody working in the Västra Götaland region in in Sweden. And he mentioned a figure, which I don't know if it's correct, but he said that, well, in the coming years, we will need to hire 15,000 people in uh, school canteens, working in school bespeaking. Uh, and who will these 15,000 be? And then it struck me that, I mean, this is a situation where it should be possible to organize things so that not everybody needs to know, have a very high proficiency of the Swedish language. You can have someone leading a group that, that sort of run, runs most of it, and, and then you could you sort of use your other skills and qualifications that you have. So I think that, I mean, to some extent, I think we, I'm an employer myself, we need to reconsider, I mean, how can we adapt our way of working, our organizations, to sort of the skill set that is available in the population? And of course, the hope should be that, that by time you, you will learn the language too. But it, was, it struck me as, as a very clear example of where, where you can think of it as some sort of back office organization almost, that you don't need to be in the front line. There will be people uh, working in the kitchens and there will be 15,000 of them. And that's a rather large number, I think. Thank you. We have another question over here. <clears throat> it seems like the first generation has, has a lot of problem picking up in terms of employment and income. Do you know anything about the second generation of immigrants? Will they pick up? Um, yes, I mean, there's a lot of uh, studies looking at that. But what we see is, I mean, if you are statistically, if you're born in Sweden with, with the two parents born outside Europe, uh, then you have a disadvantage uh, in the education system and in, in the labor market. And very much of it is, is as it seems, in the th- statistical sense, channeled through uh, poorer uh, performance in, in compulsory education. So anything we can fix at early ages will help us a lot in the future. Is that a, your conclusion from Denmark and Norway as well? That uh, echoes what I see in the Norwegian data as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Denmark as well. But, but at the same time, the second generation is much closer to, to children of native-born parents than they are to their own parents is, as far as economic performance. So, so, so it, it's, it's, it's a step in the right direction, mm-hmm. but we're not there. We have room for one final question. Short question and a short answer. <laughs> okay, uh, Try to end with a more positive message, maybe. Uh, so we know that refugees that come to Sweden have they're not matched to the Swedish labor market. Uh, and still, when we see all these graphs you show, the first three, four, or five years, we see some rapid increases in employment rates. Uh, are those just like subsidized employments, or are there some employers that actually see these skills? Or what's going on there? Because it looks really good the first years, and then. Problems start to rise. How do we? What's what's your view on this? Yeah, we, maybe we can start with with uh, with uh, Norway and and uh, and Denmark because they have a very rapid access to the labor what, what, market. It wasn't the Swedish experience. Was, this was a general a general comment on all three presentations. Is that what you're saying? The, the hmm? mostly okay. Then a little. Thank you. Though. <laughs> uh, no, w- w- but that's good because then I get a chance to say that we shouldn't run out of this room saying that everything is good in Sweden in the long term, at least compared to, to Norway and Denmark. It's, it's, first of all, it's not about being the best or worst in class. The big, big question is why are 
all these Western countries doing so poorly? Or why are so many people doing so poorly in these uh, labor markets? That is, to me, the big issue. The second and more technical point is that we have not harmonized our data yet. There might be devils uh, luring in the details here so that we, we should really see before we, we take too much away from these comparisons. But it, this, the differences in the overall patterns over time are, are quite striking. Um, well, you know, in, in the Swedish data, it's kind of hard to disentangle subsidized employment from, from other forms of employment, given the, the, the institutions. But to the extent that we've been able to do that, we see that most people do not enter within, within sort of uh, programs within the PS that are uh, subsidized employment. But then, of course, you can have this new start job and instex job, but then it's harder to, to disentangle at some point. But, but it's, um, typically, it seems that it's people also enter at least regular employment. Finally, uh, the three of you now, how will you continue your research in this area? What's the most important to look into, Bernd? What is most important? Yes. Uh, oh, that's... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it, we'll, we'll still have to keep digging into understanding why it is that in, in, in this modern welfare state that, that we, uh, we see individuals. And you, know, you get the... I should point out that that when they start dropping out of the labor market, in my figures, they're they're in their mid thirties. They're, they're they're not fifty five. They're they're in mid thirties, and and why why people in the mid thirties uh, end up on on welfare programs rather than in gainful employment? That that is, a, yeah, and we need to understand more of that. Marilise, what's your most important research for the moment? Well, right now I'm probably doing. T- going to do a bit more on those graphs. I show you about the early retirement pension and saying this is a brick, a part of the puzzle, and see what happens with the reform when we get in some more years. And then I have a plan also to use uh, education uh, information. I was talking about that we're going to implement them here because, of course, uh, qualification is a very important a part of it. Uh, so we're also looking into how much extra education is needed in order to sometimes it might not be that the education that some refugees and other bring it might be different but it might just be a notion that firms don't know that these qualifications actually exist so in some cases small courses might make a step at least in showing because we know that having a danish education is, then it's much easier to get employed to get an earning and so forth so that would be a part of it, too, what I'm really looking at. Well, look, finally, what's the next step? Um, I think that one important task for research is to, to figure out how different policies and programs at different levels of government interact with and, and sometimes conflict with each other. And also, of course, this really long-term perspective, this huge and rapid sort of transition of our societies that is going on and has been going on for a long time, what consequences that will have for society, the labor market, and the economy as a whole. Thank you so much. Before I leave the floor to Michael, uh, give uh, the panel a big applause. Yes, and I, I would also like to, on the behalf of SNS, thank you all for coming, Bernd, marie louise and Olof, and all of you in the audience for coming and uh, providing uh, interesting questions. Uh, As I mentioned earlier, uh, this seminar was the first of many activities um, within our new project at SNS about uh, integration. So keep an eye at our website for uh, future seminars within this project. Thank you so much for coming and have a nice day.